Well, uh, they had a couple of uh, three objectives um, that they've sort of identified, and their three objectives were a pinpoint landing of a light and small craft. So by small, we're talking about the size of a car. By light, we're talking about 200 or so kilos, which is really, really light. Like Apollo 11 was some 15,000. Um, and by pinpoint landing, I mean within 100 metres of the target site. Other um, missions aim for, you know, two or three kilometres off or tens of kilometres off. So this is pinpoint. Uh, the second objective is to test new technologies for operating in low gravity environments. So of course the moon has lower gravity than the earth. Um, and this is crucial for all of our you know, upcoming missions with Artemis and all that sort of thing to explore the moon and possibly Mars. And then finally, uh, potentially this extra success that they've dubbed this extra success on top of their minimum and full success criteria, which they have actually achieved, was to potentially look at some um, mineral samples at this site, uh, which may be from the moon's mant mantle, which is a sort of very interior layer of the moon that might actually hint at its origins. So Claire, why, why were they so intent on a very precise targeted landing site? Well, it's never been done, Bev. It's just never been done to this precision, really. Um, the only comparable sort of mission would have been the Hayabusa um, spacecraft, which you might remember uh, touched onto an asteroid. But asteroids are uh, really, really low gravity. So it's it's actually not so, uh, well, it's difficult in its own way, but it's not quite like the moon. And the moon's just really difficult as a target to, to land on, do what we call a soft landing, which is, you know, what we're aiming for here, not a crash landing or a hard landing. And that's basically the the atmosphere is really thin it's dusty um the surface isn't equally smooth everywhere and as i said that low gravity can be a real kicker yeah now it's already run into some problems with its you know its power that it's sort of not generating what is that going to mean um and is it going to be super problematic for what it really wants to achieve that, you know what you've already outlined yeah, so the objectives one and two, which is, you know, the minimum and, and full expectations have been met. Not sure about the extra success at this stage, because like you said, um, the solar panels, which are, are cool in their own right, they're actually flexible. So this kind of solar sheet technology that they actually attached with Velcro or Velcro adapted to the um, to the spacecraft. And what they've, uh, what they've found is that even though it successfully touched down and successfully deployed its two probes, um, they sort of realised it's running completely on battery power, which was not the aim. The aim was to run off solar generated power. And what's happened is they've um, managed to send a whole lot of data back to Earth, which is really great and a big success. However, they've had to shut it down at about 12% of battery, uh, which is enough to restart it in the event that the solar panels do see the light of the sun. Uh, and the point here is that they think that the solar panels are actually facing west, which at the moment sort of suggests it's sort of in the moon's night time. So because of the way the moon works with sun, uh, with, with light and darkness, it takes about 29.5 Earth days for a full cycle of night and day on the moon. So we hopefully, maybe, fingers crossed, might see a whimper of life in maybe two weeks. So we can chat then, Bev. Yeah, we can do that again. <laughs> you know, so many countries are really have become so interested again in exploring the moon, China among them. What are they hoping to do? They've, they were the first to sort of land on the dark, is it the dark side of the moon? Are they going to attempt that again this year? So the evil side. So uh, we often, <laughs> uh, we call it, we call it the far side of the moon because it's actually just the side we never see. It's it's not actually dark on, when you're over there because eventually it does actually see some light. We just don't get to see that side because the side's always locked to Earth, the side that we see. Yep. So it's the near and the far, although we love the dark side of the moon. I love calling it that. Uh, you know, astronomy is the darkest of scientists. So that's the sciences. So that's perfectly okay. Uh, but yes, you're absolutely right. China have uh, really just um, galvanized uh, the world in to action actually you know we've got um, India have joined the space race now successfully landing China have successfully landed and now Japan have successfully landed and they're actually the first countries in the last uh, since the 1970s really that have successfully landed there um, and are trundling around in, in the last decade and it's really it's really quite fascinating that this um, big a big sort of um, push is coming from Asia and it's got some really interesting geopolitical ramifications and it's not surprising that everybody wants to get in on it. Um, even some US um, commentators, uh, some political commentators have sort of, and Congress have, have suggested a little bit of fear there because essentially whoever gets there first basically gets to lay down the law of the land and there's been a few delays with US Artemis 
program with uh, two, Artemis 2, which was the astronauts going out to the moon and coming back, and then Artemis 3, which is where they're actually landing, both being delayed from 2024 to 2025 and 25 to 26, um, respectively. And that's causing a bit of consternation amongst um, some US and their allies. Which is interesting because if you think about the fact that, of course, Russia and the US were in that race to get a man on the moon first, um, is, is it, d does that sort of ownership, if you want, not last? Or is it now who's going to dominate during this next phase? Well, I think historically the race to the moon was a, probably a symbolic um, thing back in the sort of 60s and 70s. The Cold War, uh, and yeah. Yeah, exactly. So it's a very symbolic symbol of strength. And now uh, there are far more reaching ramifications uh, for having a seat at this space table. Um, essentially, you've got uh, nationalism and competition. You know, you've got competition for potential resources on the moon and other bodies, economic and industrial and technological advancements. You know, whoever gets the business keeps the business. We've got militarization and security. And then, of course, there's all the social and philosophical and legal debates that the that are going on and it's sort of an entirely new space race uh, in really new frontiers yeah yeah it's changed really changing both here and on that far side good to talk as always Claire take care thank you so much Beth